Bob Scully's World Show is made possible in part by GDI, Commercial Cleaning Services, one provider, one solution. And by Clocks Technologies, Biophotonic Lighting manages skin from within. Hi, this is Bob Scully and welcome to another edition of the World Show, the Free Markets series. Do you like chocolate? Do you like potato chips? Do you like to gamble? Do you like to have a drink now and then? Do you like all of the above? Do you feel guilty? Well, don't. That's over now. Support and moral help are on the way in the person of Bill Wirtz, our guest this week, the head of the Consumer Choice Center in Brussels, Belgium. Here he is. Bill Words, welcome to the Free Market Series. Thank you for having me. And I can sense we're going to have some fun because I'm going to start with a quote from you. People get a sense of that. And a lot of people will agree. Here we go. People are sinners. People want to smoke, eat fatty foods, and drink soda. And politicians need to start to come to grips with it. These are all products we should consume in moderation and with transparent information about their health concerns, but we should stop criticizing the innate desire to have them in the first place. We have created a public policy monster that lurks out from the back room once we eye the cookie jar, when we should actually be completely unapologetic about the fact that we like candy, we lust after soda, and that we love chocolate. And I can hear the applause <laughs> from here. So those are very sensible things but they need to be said, and that's what you do at the Consumer Choice Center in Brussels. Is it a hard task? Oh, absolutely. There's a myriad of people who would disagree with that, who mm. work in public policy, politicians, all types of bureaucrats, who don't agree with that sentiment because they have a different sense of what the government is supposed to do. Um, and that's where I disagree. The, the, the entire question of what is the government supposed to do? Is the government supposed to tell us how we should eat uh, and how we should live and, and, and you know, basically pushing us towards becoming 125 years old. Uh, is that the goal? And I don't think it is. I don't think that's what the government ought to do. Uh, and even when it tries to do it, it's very inefficient. So that's what I look at on, on my daily basis. But the contradiction, of course, stems from the fact that people might agree with all that in principle and, and would be ashamed even to say, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm against this, I'm against that. But in point of fact, they're scared of something. They're scared of public reaction or public morals. Or what is it they're scared of? Well, the education, the education system tells us to be guilty about a lot of things. It tells mm -hmm. us to be guilty about success. It tells us about you know, being guilty about exploiting that success to our benefit, uh, being, you know, luxury is a bad thing, uh, enjoying us a gluttony, you know, all these sins that we're told that, that are so bad. So we like them, and many people agree with the sentiment that I express, but they wouldn't say it themselves because they're seen as, you know, indulging in something that's bad for people, you know, and there's a lot of good health trends. Don't get me wrong. Uh -huh. People want to live healthy and should be encouraged to do so. But the, 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 the role of government should not be to tell us um, which chocolate we should eat and how much of it, um, because that's up to individuals. And when in, uh, elsewhere in the research, I read a, uh, an article very well written where you, again, you sort of disassemble all, this, uh, all these reasonings, these phony reasonings, and you say, here we have it, punish the people. That, to you, that's their basic driving force, punishment. Yes. Uh, it, it is a punishment because the, the, the way you express yourself is how you live and what you eat and what you do. And uh, restricting people in that individuality, no matter what you think about it, mm -hmm. that, is, uh, that to me is illiberal uh, in the strict words, uh, sense of the word. The, the liberal state was there to protect individuals from threat, violence, uh, yeah. the, 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 the justice is protecting contracts. But now we've moved so far away from what government was supposed to do to now telling us, you know, how much sugar we should consume. And people should feel attacked in their, in their, in their, in their person um, when it comes to these questions. And are you ever on thin ice because at some point you move to vaping and you present an eloquent defense of, of vaping? And I recall, 
uh, greeting an entrepreneur uh, quite a while ago, or in four or five years, vaping was already on the horizon. And he, he came and he said, look, this is nicotine in its purest form and therefore not as harmful and you don't have the tar, you don't have this, you don't have that. And I didn't know what he was really talking about because vaping, I had never seen anyone do it or whatever. Uh, but now the movement against it using some statistics that, I, that have been, I think, demonstrated, some, some death rates and so on, that movement has gained in strength. Is that a case where you can't win the battle in the name of, of liberty? Well, there's a lot of myths to unpack here. And I think in, in, in general, as a, as a brief point, smoking is a public health problem. Mm -hmm. I would never endorse anyone smoking. Picking up smoking has serious health risks and people shouldn't do it. That's my presentation towards people who want to pick up smoking or think about continuing it. Mm -hmm. It's not good for you. Now, for decades and decades now, the government has tried to get people off smoking. And the tools of the government have been taxation, regulation, you can't smoke on the bus stop, you can't smoke here, you can't smoke there. There's restrictions on where you can buy it, and continuously the prices increase. What we've seen is that this has created a black market and people doing it in you know, all types mm -hmm. of illegal places. Now, the free market has provided a solution. Vaping has been this solution. Um, and we know this from government experts. Public Health England says that vaping is 95% less harmful than smoking conventional mm -hmm. uh, cigarette. So, so, so it's, it's odd to me that the government, its own experts say that this is healthier and then it now cracks down on vaping because of a few scare stories. And there are a few myths to, 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 to get into on, on, on the issue of vaping. In other words, you can, but, but some of the deaths were deaths. They, they, weren't, they didn't make that up. Yes, absolutely. But if you look at if you look at the background, because now we keep finding out more about what people were vaping, in 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 all of these cases, people weren't vaping legal products. They were vaping illegal THC containing products, particularly in states where THC uh, uh, um, uh, liqu liquids cannot be purchased for vaping. So this is actually more of a prohibition problem oh. than a legal vaping problem. Vaping has been around for a while, but these scare stories are recent because now people try to get THC containing products from the black market, which are unsafe, which are not regulated. And as a result of that, we have health scares. To now deduct from that that we need to ban all vaping is completely the wrong, the wrong and, way to go And about. in fairness, I must say, apart from that, I, I saw no criticism of your positions, uh, you know, on the, on the more conventional stuff. Nobody uh, attacked chocolate uh, because you defended chocolate. I mean, these, some, of, some of those issues are, are crystal clear. Um, but uh, I thought to myself, he must get heck from the environmentalists occasionally. I mean, he, he must be taking fire from from other people who want to you know prevent us from doing things or or am I wrong? Absolutely. I mean, I've I've gotten I've gotten some criticisms when I uh, criticized the meat tax. Uh, there's this, there's this argument now that oh, yes. not only is yes, meat not healthy, yes. but we should also shouldn't eat it for environmental purposes. Um, and both of them I don't quite agree with because there are again free market solutions to that. Now I said uh, in, in in another interview where we talked about the meat tax and calorie consumption mm -hmm. being leading to obesity and that argument being presented all the time. What I said is that we know that we substitute calorie intake with something else. We all know this. You come home from a long trip, nothing's in the fridge. Mm -hmm. What do you do? You, you grab candy, you grab whatever you can find. So it's not necessarily about what you eat, but it's all about, for me, it's about physical exercise, about education. It's about having a healthy mix in your diet rather than taxing one thing out of existence. And so you undertook, for instance, a campaign against the, the so-called fat tax in Denmark and also some of the, some of the soda taxes, I think it's in France or in one of the European countries, because you really your, your primary territory is the EU. Um, are you successful? Uh, do, do, you, do you manage to push back these powerful interests? So in Denmark, we didn't campaign against it because that was a while, that was a bit before my organization was created, but it was a good example as to what happened. In Denmark, the government instituted a fat tax on saturated fats of more than 2.3% in an effort to get people to live more healthily. Mm -hmm. What people did is they stockpiled by going to Germany, <laughs> going over the border, and getting what, sausage. Exactly. And what they did, <laughs> what they did as well, is they bought the same products, same calorie intake. They just went to the, the low cost brands. They bought the same things, just <laughs> cheaper. And uh, and then what the public health uh, uh, scientists did, they looked at the people stockpiling. So that meant that uh, you know, in Denmark for a quite a few months, people didn't buy butter and so on because they bought it elsewhere uh, or they had stockpiled yeah. it already. And so they, so they saw a 10 to 15% drop 
in saturated fat consumption. So they said, oh, look, it's a success. It worked. Mm -hmm. But in reality, the, the marginal drop was 0.9%. And that is why the Danish government, with the same parliamentary majority, got rid of the tax 15 months later. So we've tried these things before. And so that's why we said on things like the soda tax or mm -hmm. all of these extra taxes that we've got experience with this. It's not the first time we've tried it. And it never worked because people react to good alternatives, not to paternalistic taxes. And at the same time, I suppose uh, one, of the, one of the obstacles you face is that people won't admit it, they'll, they, when, when, they, when they're buying the lower brand sausage, they're getting exactly what they want and nobody's, nobody's blaming them for it. Um, but, if, but if you have to have the Parliament of Denmark repeal a law, well, that's kind of humiliating, I suppose. And, uh, you know, they'd like to find a, a clever way around it and they can't. They have to repeal their own law. Yeah, I mean, what does it tell citizens? that parliament has to get involved because they eat too much. You, you, <laughs> how, how, how patronizing is it that we've got politicians telling people, you know, you're too fat. I mean, that's essentially what they're telling people. Mm -hmm. And your own elected officials tell you that you don't live a healthy uh, life, you know, because you just should live longer so you can pay more tax and uh, <laughs> be more obedient to the government and just continuously, you know, just, just be this person in the system that, uh, that subjugates you for the, for the purpose of enjoyment of bureaucrats or whatever. Mm -hmm. So to me, um, people need to stand up. Uh, for their rights to be responsible consumers. Are there people who go overboard? Yes. If you, allow, if you allow people to drive, some people will drive too fast. But the overall majority knows the health consequences and risk associated uh, with what they do, and they should do it in moderation. And I believe that most people with the internet, with all the information we have today, uh, uh, will come around to healthier diets. And we see this. And you're uh, obviously an eloquent advocate at the, at the ripe old age of 24, I might point out. And of course, <laughs> since you eat a lot of sausage and so on, I suppose we, we, you may get to 124, but we'll see. Um, but you're a very good advocate, and therefore, are you approached by interests who want you to defend them? In other words, the people who do things that are under attack, uh, they often are not very good defenders of their behavior. Um, do they come to you and to, and to the choice center, to the consumer choice center that you had to, to pick up the, the cudgel? Yes, uh, I get messages, emails, sometimes phone calls from people who say, I love to gamble and my city has now decided that, you know, I can't go to the casino at certain hours mm -hmm. or I like sugar and now I can't buy this and that anymore. And yes, people are very concerned. And you are right that people who indulge in things and love them a lot are not necessarily the best advocates. No. I know the type of vaping advocates sometimes can be a bit irritating, uh, can be a bit nerdy even about their products and cannot understand how somebody cannot feel for their, for, their, for their grievances. What I try to do is help them communicate in a productive way and help them through the Consumer Choice Center, you know, advocate on behalf of their individual liberty. Because we've got, a, you've got people who know a lot about their products, but don't know how necessarily how to make it, how to make somebody who doesn't mm -hmm. vape, who doesn't smoke, yeah. who doesn't eat chocolate, that this is something that they should defend. I always say, if you don't defend the individual liberty of your neighbor, eventually the same logic will be applied to something you like. And um, I mentioned your age, 24. Um, but more eloquent and more striking still in the research, I read that at the age of 15 or 16, you were already demonstrating in favor of, of uh, is it the right to vape or? It's to smoke in, in a bar. Oh, smoking in a bar, right. And so you came to these convictions early. How, how come? Well, I, um, I, I, at this age, I had never touched tobacco. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't relevant to me. I, I, I had smokers irritated me, but I felt that um, in this case, in, this, in the case of this law that I wrote a column against, that mm. the government was telling an owner of a bar what to do in his or her own property. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, there's bars that organize ladies' night, for instance. They are discriminating against men because women don't have to pay <laughs> entry and men have to pay entry. And that's fine. You know, you're the only of the bar, you set the rules of that bar. Um, and so, so, so I, I thought that there's no, there's, no, there's no contradiction in being for the freedom of people uh, to, uh, to, to, um, to consume uh, tobacco in, in a place, but also for some bars to decide not uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, I was proven right. Because huh. in, in, in the city that I'm from, there were five bars that did not allow smoking inside before that law. In Luxembourg? Yes. 
And what happened afterwards is many of them became less popular because as the government <laughs> generalized the smoking ban, there was no reason to go to this particular bar as a non-smoker. So what government did is it intervened in the business model of those uh, who were already practicing an alternative. And so, uh, um, yes, I've been, I've been advocating for this a long time. For me, it's a matter of principle. Yes, of course, I like to do certain things. I like to drink mm -hmm. alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so, I, of course, I'll defend it from that uh, position. But I also defend gambling. And I never really gamble that much. So it's, to me, it's a matter of principle, defending my individual liberty and defending that of others. And gambling is, is, is a, we had a guest on once, Ruben Brenner, an economist, um, who, who wasn't a gambler himself either, but who said it's a perfect textbook case of a useless prohibition. Uh, and he was able to demonstrate that. Not, not that people don't occasionally lose all their savings gambling, but that to, pro to prohibit it and try to control it like that is counterproductive. It, 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 it's, it's clear. Th that, and also this idea that the company's providing certain services and products benefit from those who go overboard. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, th th there's, no, there's no interest in a casino for those who bankrupt themselves because they, do, they end up not being <laughs> regular customers. And uh, a, a tobacco company doesn't want people to smoke three, four, four packs a day. It's more about you know, having regular consumers. And, and an alcohol company also doesn't want mm -hmm. to get a bad reputation from people you know, chugging two bottles of whiskey a day. It is all about you know, serving a, a consumer base that wants to do things in moderation. And so, yeah, this idea that the outliers should be used to generalize about uh, all consumers and stigmatizing all consumers to me doesn't make too much sense. And I guess it becomes, the, the whole thing becomes more delicate when you approach areas where people who, who, are, who are condemning a certain practice can point to the necessity of, of, of uh, doing that. For instance, you know, somebody in a, in a city who is trying to, you know, and there are a lot of activists who, uh, who go for bikes and they, they poison the life of, of, of motorists. And, and despise them and criticize them and so on. But they've got something going for them, which is the consumption of, of, of gasoline and the traffic jams and everything else. They, they have a stronger case, it seems, in a way, uh, whereas the motorists you know, said, well, I got to drive my kids to school. Oh, who cares about that? Just, just walk them to school. What do you do in those cases? Well, the question is about leading by example. If you have if you have a good alternative, people will you know people will catch on to it. So if if cycling through a city makes it more efficient for you, then that's what you should do. And by leading by example, you'll convince others of doing it. Mm -hmm. I always give the examples of vegetarians. Vegetarians um, said that we don't want to eat meat; it's not good for the environment. We don't think it's ethical. And led by example, you know, 30 years ago it was much more difficult to get a vegetarian meal in mm -hmm. a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Today it's everywhere. You always have vegetarian meal, and now even a lot of vegan meals. Mm -hmm. They led by example, and they changed the marketplace. And uh, and and the problem now is that many of them think that this is not enough. So now we need the power of the government to regulate, to legislate, to tax, to do everything to get all the people who didn't join yet to get on board. Now they'll they'll soon find out that consumers don't like this behavior. Consumers don't like paternalism, mm -hmm. and they'll rebel against it. You know, we've seen it in France uh, when the environmentalists said, let's tax petrol more, and people set half the country on fire yeah. uh, as, a re as, as a reaction to it. So in the, in the case of the, of, the, of the cyclists and the motorists, let them lead by example. If cycling is the better alternative, people will, people will do it. But if you tell people they can't use their car, then you'll have a revolt. But at the same time, for those who think you shouldn't be able to use your car, it becomes an itch. It's something that they obsess on and they have to get their point across. And it's, it's different from uh, somebody eating chocolate, the neighbor eating too much chocolate. They might disapprove privately, but it's not an itch. But the, 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 um, the same neighbor with a noisy motor parking his car at night next to them, they can't stand it. Uh, there, there's no easy way around all that. Of course, but let, let we, you know, I could also obsess about this. You know, when, think about it. There's people who want to regulate um, those who want to enjoy a cigarette. Mm -hmm. They want to regulate it for people they will never meet, ever. You know, in most cases, you will never meet all the people that, you, that these, these laws apply to. They have no idea about their lives. They don't know about their hopes and aspirations and problems in their life or just the simple enjoyment of you know, doing that after a meal or whatever. The, 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 the people who regulate don't never meet all these people, but suddenly have the temerity to tell you 
what to do. Just mm-hmm. if you consider the the, yes. the arrogance of, of of imposing laws on people you can you will never meet, and also punishing them for it. You know, there's uh, there's a lot. You know, depending on 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 which nanny state policies you infringe on, you can get fines, and and you can, in the case of a business owner selling certain things, even go to jail. Course, so why yeah. uh, uh, why they should be offended and obsess about things, but I should not? I wouldn't quite see. So so I think. Um, I think what both sides need to do is respect individual liberty and figure out how to work together. I think the whole the whole purpose of growing up, and I say this as a as a, as a fairly young person, is that you know we should not need our nanny to tell us how to get along. We can do this as individuals. Yeah, the nanny state is it, that's a very catchy term, and I don't know who coined it, but it describes exactly what you were fighting. Yeah, I didn't I didn't come up with it, but uh, it, it is certainly a good representation. And and um, the the um, uh, years and years and years ago, I'm reaching back here, um, there was a book club in the high schools across North America offering bestsellers to kids at a discount and uh, appropriate, appropriate readings, of course. And one of them was called The Mouse That Roared. Does that ring a bell? It does not, unfortunately. And it became a movie, but it was a book originally, and it was about Luxembourg because Luxembourg in the book declares war, I think, on the U.S. or something, and, and wins. I, f- I forget what it was, but it was kind of a, g- a gag. It was, it was a fun book. Definitely fiction. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, uh, Luxembourg has remained with me as a symbol of great individualism. You seem to exemplify that. Are you drawing lots of uh, followers? Uh, in Luxembourg, uh, I wish. Whenever I go home, I always feel like they consider me more of the ideologue in a country full of pragmatists. Mm-hmm. Uh, Luxembourgish people will, you know, decide on one law or the other based on whether it makes sense to them. So that can actually create quite some inconsistencies. Luxembourg is not, unfortunately, doesn't base itself in the philosophy of individualism. Mm-hmm. This country, fortunately, does, but yeah. uh, but but unfortunately, we don't. Many European countries struggle with that, and I hope to be, you know, the uh, one of the people who, who who's able to give people an idea as to, you know, what general principles to follow. Because there's, there's a, another barrier, which is simply the, the conformity and, and, uh, and conserva- natural conservatism, I'd call it, which exists out there, um, such that uh, people who hold these positions aren't, aren't drawing that many followers or, or, or public followers. And there should, you would think that there would be political parties by now that represent that point of view, the libertarian or whatever you want to call it point of view, and that they would be growing. But the libertarian candidates here in America do dismal numbers. Um, Have you been approached to do politics? I actually did politics in the past, and actually politics led me to question many of the things that that uh, you know that that government does. Mm-hmm. You know, I was running myself uh, for parliament at the age of, of eighteen in Luxembourg. In Luxembourg, and uh, my political party suggested that we should tax homeowners if they don't rent it in order to help ah, the, yeah. the, the 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 housing market. And I, my first indication was why they own the property they should be able to do with it whatever they like and so that was the first time that I sensed that I had a different position than whatever liberal democrat meant Mm -hmm. Um, and so then I started getting more into you know free market uh, economics and 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 the in and and the positions of individual liberty and that's what I've been uh, doing since now the question of the the nanny state and individual uh, liberty where is it? Well, it actually is cross-party. I believe that many people haven't quite discovered that they are uh, that they, that they are believers in individual liberty, mm-hmm. and that's why you find champions of individual liberty in many different political parties. So, with the Consumer Choice Center, we can work with many different groups in the European Parliament or in national governments in order to convince them to reconsider the uh, the mainstream positions. But it should, in some way, lead to political action, shouldn't it? If it's if it's logical and you believe in it, you want it to you want it you don't impose it. Certainly not coming from where you're coming from, but you would want it shared, and therefore you would want to proselytize a little bit. Yes. Well, to be to be quite frank, the nanny state policy and the lifestyle regulations that I talk about are not the most important issue of politics. You know, in Europe we talk about. Brexit, we talk yeah. about the EU, where it should be in the future. Uh, we talk about all this you know, monetary policy. And so when I come around and I say, oh, there's a sugar tax suggested in the European Parliament or whatever, yeah. then it doesn't seem like quite a priority. And that's why these rules and regulations have been piling up and it goes a bit unnoticed. But I think that eventually they pile up to a degree where people become aware of it and say, 
wait a second, what's going on? It happened with the Gilets Jaunes, and I think it will happen again in other areas. But unfortunately, me getting that awareness to people on, on the way when other political issues seem more important, uh, that for now, is... For now, it's an uphill climb. It's a struggle, indeed. Yeah. Um, but order up a new reprint, get, get a donor to, to your institute, and order up a reprint of The Mouse That Roared and send it out to all the citizens of Luxembourg, because I think it has been forgotten, that book, and it was a lot of fun. And, and, and you could come back here as president of Luxembourg and maybe even smoke on the set in front of us or something like that. So long life to you and, and, and to, to the center. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, and I'll be back. All right. Thank you. Bill Wirtz, and now here's someone else coming up on The World Show. The technology that we have developed is a technology that will improve the outcomes of surgery for soft tissue repair. Right now, there are, if we look at the need, the market need or the, mm -hmm. um, the clinical need, um, rotator cuff surgeries, there are failures up to about 90% mm. of the cases in, in some uh, published uh, data. So if you look at the clinical literature, um, between 20 and 90% um, of the patients that are treated with standard of care have failure. Mm. What kind of failure? Mainly retears or of the rotator yeah. cuff, of the shoulder, shoulder yeah. rotator cuff. And um, so we want to improve that. Bill Wirtz was our guest this week on the Free Market series of The World Show. I'm Bob Scully. Have a great week. Thanks. Bob Scully's World Show was made possible in part by GDI. Commercial cleaning services, one provider, one solution. And by Clocks Technologies. Biophotonic lighting manages skin from within.